everybody for joining us here this afternoon. Uh, and thank you to those of you who are joining us this afternoon, this evening, or maybe even this morning on Facebook Live. My name's Nick Menzies. I'm a senior governance specialist here at the World Bank. And I've also had the pleasure, continuing pleasure, of being the task team leader of the Kenya Judicial Performance Improvement Project. And I'm very happy to be here this afternoon with my good friends from the Kenyan judiciary, the honor of having the Chief Justice and President of the Supreme Court, David Moraga, as well as the project coordinator and advocate of the High Court of Kenya, Nancy Kanyago. Thank you for joining us for this fireside chat. I don't know where the fire is, but we'll continue on anyway. Um, Chief Justice, uh, you've had many successes and achievements in your career, but you're perhaps uh, most well known uh, for the uh, decision around the Kenya uh, presidential election last year um, and I this is the overturning of the election um, for those of you who are not aware it made international news uh, it was the first time this had happened on the African continent and I think the audience would love to hear a little bit about uh, what that meant to you personally and also to, to the court and the kinds of pressures that this put on the court and how you managed uh, what was a very tricky and delicate uh, situation thank you thank you very much Nick um, Good afternoon. Democratic nations uh, employ elections as a political process by which they elect governments and replace others. As we all know, elections are competitive features well over. Presidents in many parts of the world, especially in Africa, wield a lot of power. The influence that comes with that power makes the office of the president extremely attractive. That influence cascades, cascades down to the lowest level, and the candidates involved in an election do what they can to be elected or re-elected. Besides the candidates, the electorate themselves get very excited with the, the promise of improved standard of living and, uh, and other things. All these factors make elections, especially in Africa, very high pressure events. If they are mismanaged, or if the candidates and the, 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 I mean, the people involved don't follow the law, if the average citizen does not believe in them or perceive them to be fair, elections can lead to uh, instability in a country. Kenya is an example of that. In 2007, because of the disputed presidential election, we had uh, skirmishes that left us with about 1,100 people dead, and about 3,000 others displaced. It drove the country almost to the brink of precipice. That affected the economy with the annual GDP plunging from a high of seven to, in 2007 to 0 0.3% in 2008. So you can see how important a free and fair election is in a country. And for it to be free and fair, the institutions charged with the responsibility of handling elections, the, 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 the election body, and even the courts in the resolution of disputes must be institutions that command public confidence. In 2007, the reason why we had that was because of alleged non-confidence in the judiciary to resolve uh, the, the presidential uh, election dispute. In Kenya, the, const I mean the Constitution vests judicial authority in the judiciary. As the head of that institution, and bearing in mind the history of our country, I thought 
to myself that it would be a terrible dereliction of my duty. It would be terrible, a heinous, actually, a heinous betrayal of the Kenyan people if I didn't do what was required and what was right. Fortunately, I was not alone. Four other judges uh, were of the same view. And we looked at the case and decided it the way we had to decide it, and that is to annul the election. A lot of pressure came after that, uh, but by the grace of God, we withstood that. And with the prayers of the nation and very many other people, we, we were able to withstand that. Uh, and, and, uh, and I'm happy to say that that has, is now behind us, and we are able to go on. So it's a question of, uh, of uh, a determination, a determination that it would be a betrayal of the Kenyan people if we did not do what was right. Because we would have plunged the country back to the skirmishes we had in 2007. I would have hated to be associated with that. With that. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, the Kenyan judiciary has made remarkable progress since the new constitution in 2010. And I'm happy to say the bank's been able to support the judiciary uh, in much of that progress. Um, and I've heard word around the corridors this week that other judiciaries in your neighboring countries and across uh, the region are interested uh, in getting support from the bank. Can you maybe talk a little bit about how that arose uh, and maybe some tips for your fellow uh, chief justices? Thank you, Need. Um Around about 2004, 2005, the donor funding to the, to the Kenyan government, especially to the just sector, was just one basket, which was, uh, I mean, shared by all the other agencies. And the, the then Chief Justice, uh, Honorable Justice Gicheru, found that the, the amount which was trickling to the judiciary was not enough at all. He was introduced to uh, a World Bank official, had discussions with, uh, with her. She's here. I had discussions with her. And he, 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 mean, he said, look, it, it will have to be done through the Minister of Finance. Because, uh, I mean, World Bank uh, deals with the Minister of Finance in most cases. So he wrote a letter to the Minister of Finance with a copy to the country director. And uh, after some discussions, uh, I mean, and the evaluation, uh, it was agreed, and uh, a sum of uh, of uh, 120,000 million, I mean, 120 million US dollars was given to the judiciary. And now we're actually going to play a short video clip. Um, which will show you a little bit about some of the reforms that the Kenya judiciary has been able to do with this money.
Now, Nancy, of course, uh, providing better services is, uh, is about more than just infrastructure. Uh, can you share with us some of the changes the Kenyan judiciary has been making in terms of access to justice and better performance? Yeah, so um, other than uh, constructing courts uh, closer to uh, the people so that uh, they're not traveling long distances, uh, on average we've seen that uh, most Kenyans uh, travel over 200 kilometers uh, to physically access a court. Uh, one of the uh, ways the project has uh, supported um, uh, Kenyans to access justice is through embracing alternative forms of uh, dispute resolution. Um, the judiciary of Kenya has now uh, adopted court annexed uh, mediation, uh, which uh, enables um, uh, uh, people to uh, litigants to avoid the uh, formal uh, court process uh, and uh, uh, conclude their disputes um, in a much uh, faster time period. Uh, through mediation, uh, uh, we have seen that uh, cases can be concluded in 60 days as opposed to an average of uh, two years uh, through the formal court system. Um, the judiciary is also supporting um, alternative justice systems uh, through training of elders uh, to help uh, settle uh, civil disputes and hence uh, avoid um, the formal court uh, process, uh, all in a way to uh, increase access to justice. That's great. And I think something that Kenyan judiciary has been doing, which really is a model for many other judiciaries around the world, is really basing a lot of its reforms on data, hard data. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about how the judiciary has gone about that and then what the judiciary is starting to do with that kind of data. Um, so the project uh, commenced in uh, 2012. And uh, prior to that, uh, there would be um, if you ask the judiciary what was the total workload, how many cases were in the system, uh, there was no um, uh, data available. Uh, you would hear case, uh, numbers of one million cases uh, in the system, but there was really no uh, way of verifying that. Therefore, with support of the project, uh, the judiciary undertook a, a case audit, uh, literally uh, a physical count of the cases uh, that were in the system and uh, determined uh, the number of cases, uh, and uh, there were about uh, 420,000 uh, uh, as of 200, uh, as of 2013. And um, uh, from that exercise, the judiciary was able to know uh, its caseload, um, and uh, was also able to develop a way of um, measuring uh, how many cases are coming into uh, the court on a daily basis, uh, how many are being resolved, uh, how many are being adjourned. All this is data that is now kept that uh, previously the judiciary uh, was um, not tracking um, and hence had no idea of uh, its caseload. Um, but as of today, uh, the judiciary is able to know uh, its total caseload, um, how many cases are being handled per judicial officer, uh, per court, uh, per court level, for example, at the High Court, at the Magistrates Court, at the Supreme Court, on average, how long it's taking uh, per individual uh, judicial officer uh, to conclude the various cases, uh, but as well, um, uh, on average, how long it's taking any particular uh, type of case, whether a criminal case or civil case, uh, to go uh, through um, the judicial system. And uh, this data has been critical in um, informing various uh, uh, processes in the judiciary uh, from uh, recruitment. Uh, based on the caseload, uh, the Judicial Service Commission is able to know how many judicial officers they require, uh, the number of staff they require. Um, this data is also being used for uh, budgeting and um, uh, rolling out uh, performance management. So has really transformed the way the judiciary uh, plans uh, and makes decisions. If I may add, uh, Nick, <clears throat> the data also helps me as, as the chief justice to know the number of staff I require in each station, particularly in the high court uh, stations where, uh, like the commercial division, the, the, the figures uh, enable me to determine how many judges I need to post there. Yeah. yeah. And Chief Justice, uh, the Kenyan judiciary has also taken the step of, of implementing performance contracting. Um, and this is never a popular move, uh, particularly in the judiciary. 
Um, and maybe you could help us understand a little bit about how that arose and what kind of benefits you see from a system of performance contracting within the judiciary. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> performance as, as, as a concept of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of governance is a recent uh, kind of thing. And uh, when it came to Kenya and it was uh, talked over, it was being introduced by the executive and the judiciary said, look, that, that's, that is not our business. You cannot uh, say a judge is supposed to determine so many cases in a, in a, in a, in a month or in a year. Uh, that is interfering with the judicial independence and all that. And, and there were quite a number of arguments. But then with the, with the, with the World Bank funding and, and uh, training and benchmarking, we realized that um, performance is tied to accountability. You, while we have to be independent, we cannot be independent without being accountable. And that uh, changed the, 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 the view. And then we and, and and it was discussed. It was discussed with I said with the, with the benchmarking. The judiciary itself came up with its own performance measurement uh, process. Judges and and each court station were asked to themselves say, look, we are accountable. We must expeditiously deal with cases. We know cases. Some take a very very long time. Others are. Uh, what we call run of the meal, which we can dispose of within a very short time. Determine for yourselves how many cases you are able to decide uh, within a given period. The Court of Appeal was given. I, I remember I was in the Court of Appeal that time. Uh, and, and each station came up with its own figures. And, and of course, with comparison, this station says they can do this. This one says they can do this. We all agreed and, and set our own uh, uh, measurements and said, look, on average, each judge is supposed to determine so many cases. Now with that, now we have uh, what we call the daily uh, return uh, templates, which tell us how much each judge is doing on a monthly basis. Of course, there is a, an argument, there's a time you can find that a judge has not done as well as, as much as he did last month. And it, this is because of the complexity of the cases he's handling during that time. But then, when you find that, and, and that's one other thing I have heard, when you find that one judge is not writing judgments for a very long period, you, from this, I mean, these figures, you are able to pin him down and say, look, what are you doing? What are you doing? You can't say you are independent. We are all independent, but we are accountable. And, and that has helped a great deal in, 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 in performing, yeah. and especially on, on um, on getting judges to do their work as they are required to. And maybe you could share a little bit about the rewards that you provide. Yes, yes, that, that's, a, that's a, a very good component. What we came up with is that the stations which are, are performing very well, we came with rewards. And of course that has uh, now uh, I mean, gives a competitive uh, uh, kind of uh, incentive. And, and the, 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 the machinists themselves, especially in the other stations, in fact, my last month I was in one station and uh, one machinist was saying, ZJ, we were number two and you didn't even mention that. And, uh, and I said, look, yes, okay, I see, I see that omission. I will, I will make sure that we, we, we recognize that. That is, uh, I mean, an incentive which is uh, being shared. And uh, the, the machinists themselves, when they come for promotion, like next year we are going to recruit quite a number of judges, they know that we are going to look at those figures eh, in their promotion. And, and they are doing very well. So, I mean, that has been an incentive, and we, I can see it. Yeah. There are quite a number of stations where the magistrates are doing very well. And I think it was when the magistrates realized that they were going to be asked for this data went to get promoted, the reporting rates went way up. Yes. And currently over 95% of courts are reporting every month. Even judges, because we are going to recruit even, I mean, uh, uh, judges of the Court of Appeal, uh, because of, uh, of retirement and others, we have quite a number of positions. We are going to recruit judges of the Court of Appeal. So the High Court judges are making sure that their records look good. <laughs> One thing that really struck me when I uh, first went to Kenya uh, was these court user committees. Um, and Nancy, I was wondering whether you could talk a little bit about court user committees, because I think they're a really interesting innovation that Kenya has. 
um, and maybe talk a little bit about the support uh, that they have been provided over the last few years. Um, so the court user uh, committee is a committee that's um, located at every court level and it's comprised of uh, different actors in the uh, justice sector, uh, often chaired by the head of station, therefore a judge or a magistrate, and has membership from prisons, probation, children's officer, as well as uh, a non-governmental organizations working on justice uh, sectors. Um, it's replicated at the national level and is chaired by the uh, Chief Justice. And at the national level, again, it's represented at the highest levels by uh, the head of the police, head of the prisons. And uh, what um, this court uses committee, they meet regularly uh, to address uh, local challenges um, to the administration of justice at that local level. And um, through this project, uh, we were able to provide grants of up to $5,000 uh, per court uh, user committee for them to be able to address local problems as they identified those problems in terms of um, hindering uh, efficiency and access to justice. So we found that uh, the court user committees have used those grants to pay for uh, witness expenses. Um, they have looked at their data and they have seen that uh, they have um, adjournments uh, that lead to delays. And when they interrogate the uh, reasons for adjournments, they're like, uh, witnesses are not uh, coming to court uh, because of the cost of uh, traveling to court. Therefore, they have provided uh, resources to bring witnesses to court, and that has um, addressed issue of adjournment. Uh, other courts have uh, purchased uh, photocopiers uh, so as to avail witness expenses, uh, sorry, witness statements, uh, because uh, the lack of witness statements has been seen as an impediment uh, that also uh, causes uh, adjust, uh, adjournments. Um, as we saw from the video, uh, because of uh, the state of infrastructure, uh, some courts, uh, although the funds are limited, they have used those funds uh, to improve uh, facilities such as cells so that uh, men, women, and children uh, are not sharing uh, uh, one cell block. Um, therefore, uh, great results, a lot of innovation, um, just using um, limited funds of uh, up to $5,000 uh, per, per court. Apart from the, 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 the court users, <clears throat> the funds we have used also in, in, in training. In the, in the Judiciary Training Institute, we have, um, because you know capacity building is, 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 a, is a key component. We have used those funds in training, the, the judges and magistrates and other staff, support staff, and that has gone a long, long way. One other thing we didn't mention about the, 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 the courts, you could not see everything from the, the, the clips we played here. We have done modern courts, modern courts with self-contained chambers, and and uh, with in, in most of most of them we have even lactating uh, rooms for the mother for breastfeeding mothers. Mothers, we have advocates changing room. We have, um, I mean, modern uh, toilet facilities even for the members of the public. And you know that is a, a critical thing. That's a critical thing when you get a member of the public waiting out there for his case for. Uh, for hours, and it doesn't have a clean toilet to go to. We we we, we take that as a very a very critical uh, thing. So I mean, we, we we are quite happy. We are we have done about we are doing about 29, 29 courtrooms across the country. Some of them go up, up to about four five, four five floors, and and they are modern and and big with the several uh, courtrooms. And, and we are happy, happy with that. And uh, some, of course, are uh, much rich courts, which are not as big. So, uh, I mean, it has been a wonderful kind of uh, partnership. And as an old greenie myself, I'm very happy that some of them have solar panels too. <laughs> Chief Justice, the audience has been promised uh, some discussion about the future. Uh, and of course, all of the challenges of rule of law and access to justice in Kenya haven't been solved yet. We're almost there. Um, I was wondering whether you could talk a little bit about what you see as being the main challenges in the next five to ten years in terms of rule of law and access to justice in Kenya. Yes. Um, the, the, the main challenges are the, our processes. You know, they are manual. They are all manual. And uh, you, you know how, how slow that can be. 
we are endeavoring to we and we have started we are we are making great great advances in in uh, digitizing our uh, uh, records and uh, automating our proceedings and uh, with the ministry of uh, ICT we we are moving on very well and uh, in in my view in another one two years we should be able to uh, have um, uh, I mean use uh, technology in, in service delivery in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the judiciary. Records, you know, things, I don't know whether it is there in other jurisdictions. The integrity of the record, when you find documents sometimes either misplaced or, or some parties can arrange to, once you produce documents in court, which are critical, they, they can be misplaced and, and, uh, and later on you have a challenge with the record. Or the, the proceedings are not taken down uh, correctly, and that uh, creates a lot of problems with the integrity of the record. So with automation, we, we see that that is going to uh, help us a great deal. And perhaps sadly for us, Chief Justice, uh, the time as, your time as Chief Justice was not endless. Um, Kenya has a mandatory retirement age. I won't tell you what it is, you can guess. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Chief Justice, I was wondering you know, what you hope your legacy might be when you look back on your time as Chief Justice? Yes. <clears throat> you know, I wish you asked me what my wish is. <laughs> your because, optimistic legacy. Yes, my optimistic legacy is uh, to, first of all, leave the judiciary stronger and more independent than I found it. We are, as I've said, we are trying to automate our proceedings. You know, as you know, that's an expensive exercise and, and funding is, is, is an issue. But as I said, the ministry is trying and assisting us and we, 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 we hope to make uh, uh, that, um, that uh, a reality. The other major thing is the way we are, we are doing cases. We have backlogs. Some of our cases in our system are as old as 10 years and we have said that is unacceptable. Right now, as, as, as we speak, I, I promised the country that by the end of this year, all cases more than five years, we will complete them. We are trying to do our best. We may not complete them, but by, by the end of the year, we'll be left with very, very few cases above five years. Thereafter, we will want to uh, deal with the, the, the old cases. At the end of the day, what we want to do is we want to have an expeditious uh, uh, disposal of cases so that cases come to court and at most they should be uh, concluded within two to three years. So that will give uh, uh, investor confidence uh, and, and, uh, and uh, assist the economy because, uh, I mean, when, when investors come to a country, of course, in, in invariably there are going to be disputes and if their disputes are going to take ages before they are resolved, you're not doing much to the country. So uh, what, uh, what uh, my, my legacy would be, uh, or my wish would be, is to establish a system by which we dispose of cases as quickly as possible and be able to use technology and move forward. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chief Justice. Um, thank you very much for joining us here in the room and on Facebook Live. Um, please, I think Kenya has made a remarkable transformation in the judiciary in the last uh, eight years. Um, so please take the opportunity, if you're here in DC, to talk with the Chief Justice and with Nancy about their really insider view. Um, and please join me in thanking the panelists.